diversity in the teaching. So thanks a lot, Kathy Marie. Thank you. You should turn on your, um, I think it's on, right? Okay, is it? It is. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Oops, I forget it. Yeah. Hi, good morning. So you can listen. I can, is the, the mic okay? Um, well, so I, I was asked to talk a little bit about myself and to talk about my work and all of that in like 40 minutes top. So it could be a little more so that <laughs> we can leave room for uh, questions. You have an hour slot. Okay. Uh, but, but I like a lot the question part. So I'm going to try to do it like 30 minutes. Um, if there is anyone uh, that could check my time, yeah, I would sure. appreciate well, we it. Over yeah, like when it's when, 20, when 25 yeah. minutes. So at 12. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about diversity in physics education. Uh, and along with the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about my experience, my trajectory, and, and all that. And so this workshop is for thinking about like a gender perspective, right? And then um, I was thinking, I can never, so I, Katemaria, can never talk about gender just thinking about gender only. Because what I do and the way I work, um, I'm always thinking about the intersections of several social constructs, such as uh, race and uh, sexuality, and that's what I'm bringing here. How can we um, kind of change, I, I'm not sure if changing, but um, expanding this discussion about gender and talking about all these other social constructs. And um, my point is when we focus on gender only, we end up reproducing lots of uh, oppression that happen in society, and we don't want to do that. Right, so, um, and then I'm going to start with this um, this clip from this news that you might remember the Orlando shooting. Everyone remembers that? So after that, lots of other um, things happened, like homophobia cases uh, in, around the world. But, but this one was like a large, um, a large attack, right? So I, I decided to bring that, and that's to show how things are when we think about the world. So that's not something that's just a Brazil thing. It's not just a problem that we have. Worldwide, we have a problem with homophobia or LGBT phobia. And when we look at Brazil, we are the country that murder the majority, like we are the country that, that's the deadliest country for trans people. So we kill trans people. So we have to talk about that because when you're talking about gender, uh, we are not talking about women. When you're talking about gender, we are talking about something that's bigger than just women. And we need to also start to think about that. What does gender mean? And um, it's not the topic of this talk, but I invite everyone to um, look further on what gender is. Um, and then I bring here another clip that's from this um, attack that happened also at the University of Brasilia here in Brazil. And there were like racist and homophobic uh, attacks. And then we think, okay, so there is this thing worldwide, and there is also this climate in Brazil. And when you look at the university, that's that obviously the universities and the spaces we are, they are just a set of the larger society. So all those things that happen um, in the bigger scenario are going to repeat at the university. Um, and then we, uh, I don't know if you remember this case as well that happened here uh, in Rio from this student that was murdered. He was a black and gay student. Um, and then there was this case that this is, 
This one is like last known. Uh, these two teachers, uh, they were murdered and their bodies, they were incinerated. They were found inside a car uh, in Bahia. And uh, one of these teachers, he was, they were high school teachers and one of them was a physics teacher. Um, so I, I, I bring this large images and ideas for, um, for us to start thinking about in which ways when we talk about gender, we are also talking about all these other oppressions that people face in our society and how we can start thinking about that and how our um, work, our presence and our actions, they might help uh, to, they may contribute to this scenario or they can help fighting this oppression. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about like where I'm coming from and from a like theoretical perspective, I'm going to talk about physics identity, um, black women in physics, uh, sexual minorities in physics, and some implications of that and things that we can do. So um, I've been studying about gender and race and ethnicity in science from this uh, science education perspective. I work with physics education research and I was very interested. So uh, as uh, you're saying, I, I did my undergrad in Porto Alegre, uh, which is a city that has like 80% of the population uh, declares themselves as white. Uh, and then I was in an institute, in a physics institute, and I didn't have any black professors. But that was something that, okay, that's wrong, that's weird, but we are a minority here, right? Okay. Then I went to Bahia, to Salvador, a city that has 80% of the population being of African descent. And then I go to the physics institute and there is one black professor. And I thought, that's super strange, that there's something <laughs> really, really wrong here. It's, you were walking in the city, you see lots of black people, and then you enter the physics institute, and where are they? Um, so this is also so where I'm coming from. This is before affirmative action, right, uh, in the universities, which is pretty recent. But because um, today, when we look, you, you're going to see students and you're going to see a little bit more faculty, but still not even half in a city that's 80% black. So uh, I started to, to look, so I started to think. So I, I left Porto Alegre, I went to Salvador, and I started to thinking, um, where are the black people in physics? And there is something wrong. And then I realized I, I was usually the only black woman in the conferences that I went to. And I was, that's, that's very wrong. Um, then I decided, okay, I want to learn more about black women in physics. And then I started studying about that. And I couldn't find anything in Brazil, nothing. No data, no, um, no literature, nothing. Then I started to looking, um, abroad, and then I found a few things. Um, so that's when I went to do my PhD. Uh, then I went to Colombia, and I studied about black women in physics. Uh, more precisely, I studied how black women physicists develop their scientific identity. So how they become scientists. So I look at uh, successful black women, and okay, what made them successful? Because that's another thing that all, always happens. Like, I'm going to use the word always, which is like very strong, but most of the time what happens is uh, when we talk about black people or um, minorities in science in general, we talk about from this perspective that is talking about disadvantages. So uh, it's this model that's talking about how the how our life was hard, or how people are like, how we lack, or, or all the problems we face, um, it, which is like called the minority model. And that's important as 
like when we talk about women in general in science, it's important to understand the obstacles and all the things that we face, but it's also important to learn success. We need to, to know that we are not just like problems and uh, poverty and exclusion and all that. So there are people that they were successful. So we need to, to learn about these people as well and to see how can we make more and more people successful. So I wanted to, to learn that. And for that, I went to like from like my theories and to learn stuff. I used feminism theories with um, identity theories and critical race theory. So one of my main uh, theoretical frameworks is uh, critical race theory. If, and from that, I kind of look at the other things combined. So these are some names that uh, if you are interested in looking and learning more about those, those issues or, um, but that is talking like from a theoretical perspective. So if you want to instrumentalize yourself and learn more about uh, like deeply about these issues, uh, those are names that are interesting to learn. And this, um, this is slides, they are already, I suppose. He's taking the pictures, not even notice her. Well, it's Andre, his name is not. Yeah. Tiago? Tiago. Because I think they are ready, because the slides are already on the site, is it? Yeah, so they are ready on the website. <laughs> Um, so if you want, it's going to be there later. You don't need to copy anything. Um, and one of the key concepts that, uh, from all those things that I use is intersectionality. So it's thinking about how um, it's very limiting to look at things, just looking at one oppression. So when we look at, uh, when we study through um, an intersectional lens, we are looking how the combination of many oppressions, they are going to, to influence the experience of a person. The other concept is identity, more specifically uh, scientific identity. And then I look at how some of these things here, performance, oh yeah, cool. Performance, performance recognition, and if I stay here, maybe, here. Yeah performance, recognition, and competence. How those things, they are needed for one to look at themselves as a scientist. So when we talk about, uh, we were speaking earlier about uh, not feeling um, like feeling like a failure or an imposter. Um, so this is related to all these things in our identity. Because we might have, like, for example, competence, but if we don't have recognition, uh, we might not see ourselves as a science person or someone that is, um, you know, knowledgeable about what we are doing. Um, we might get recognition, but if we don't have competence, uh, then there's something wrong. Uh, and we need to also, like, perform well in, in our field. So all those things are necessary for us to look at ourselves as a science person and develop a scientific identity. So if we, are, we perform very well, we have competence, we know how to um, do things, I don't know, like in the lab or whatever, but um, our professor says that, oh, you don't know how to do that, or they doubt us, or if we go to a conference and people don't go to our presentations, or if you're presenting a poster and no one stops to talk to you, and then you feel like, oh, I might not be you know, that good, maybe I'm not cut for that, that's not for me, and that's going to undermine uh, your identity as a scientist. And the other concept was um, microaggression. That's, that was also talked about uh, here this morning, and I'm sure there's going to, we are going to listen about that during all the week. Because what, what are those microaggressions? Um, and specifically looking at uh, racial microaggressions, they are, you know those things that happen every day, uh, and they don't 
like people may look and say, oh, that's, that's nothing. I mean, no one is telling you something really openly sexist or racist, but there are these very subtle things that happen and they might be a look, they might be even just the presence, like you being the only person, like if you're the only woman or the only black person in a space, you're going to feel already like intimidated, right? It's weird. So it's not something that people are, so that's considered a microaggression. It's not something that people are telling you or they might be nice to you, but you feel it. It's those kinds of things that you, you know because you feel, oh, the microphone. <laughs> you, you, know, you know because you feel it, you know? Everyone knows. And sometimes it's very hard to express it. You, you can't point a finger like, what was it that made me feel uncomfortable? But you know that there was something. So that's also in this category. Or there are some other things that are, oh, that's a very good one. Like, oh, you were really articulate. You speak so well. It's like, why? What, what do you expect? That I wouldn't speak well? Because people then are expecting that you're not going to speak well. Or, oh, you, oh you, this is 24 is actually a good grade. Like, what? Did you, you didn't think I could make it? So that's an aggression. That's a microaggression. And people might say, oh, no, but he was complimenting you, saying that you went well. No, that's not a compliment. We don't feel that as a compliment, right? Um, so the, the other concept here that I'm going to be using is LGBT+, and I'm going to use this uh, during this talk, uh, to refer to sexual uh, or gender minorities to include people that feels marginalized based on their sexual orientation. Um, gender identity or gender expression uh, included but not limited to lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, intersex, uh, or asexual persons. And you can later maybe ask more about uh, gender identity or expression if you want to. And then I'm going to look at the climate at our universities. So looking at the climate means like, okay, how does it feel to be in a university here in Brazil as a woman, as a black person, as, um, mm, you'll see. Um, yeah, because there are several of those uh, layers or, or identities. And uh, everyone now is familiar with hashtags, right? So this is a very like young crowd, so everyone knows hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> very young crowd. Because uh, at some point when I talk about like hashtags, some people wouldn't know what hashtag were. Mm. So, but, but yeah, because, I mean, it's, it's relatively new, right? Um, and depending on the average age of people, then they will not know what that is. Because sometimes people think of hashtags just as a way of, I don't know, like writing something that's going to, to be highlighted in your message, but uh, it's actually a way for us to, so you, you are able to retrieve information that are tagged with this hashtag, right? Um, and hashtags, they have been um, very important for, like in the communication world and in the social movement world, it's, it's, it's a tool that's been used uh, all over the world to promote dialogue, to promote awareness about several issues. You, oh, everyone remember, I think, maybe, the, um, the um, uh, the Arab uh, Spring, mm -hmm. and that was something, for example, that was a very big case um, in communication uh, where hashtags were very important. So where people, um, they started talking, started a conversation using hashtags. Also the like Black, um, Black Lives Matter movement, it's another a movement that used a lot of hashtags. And that promotes conversations that it, they are not geographically located necessarily because you can talk to people all over the world just by um, adding this tag. And then um, that builds this conversation and bring other people that have the same realities together without frontiers in a way. We have the technological frontiers because not everyone has access to internet. 
or computers, but that's another topic. So there was this movement that was um, my teacher said. I don't know if you were familiar with that. Actually, they were like, uh, my teacher said, my secret teacher, my secret teacher said, and this is my teacher. So uh, a, a very interesting thing that happens in Brazil with hashtags is that lot, many times movements happen online and then people, they, they bring it to the physical world. They print out things uh, and put on the walls. That happens a lot with different hashtags. Um, so this one, and this I think is like a very Brazilian phenomenon to, to bring things to, from what I have read on, on this in, in communication, that happens a lot and I don't see that happening, like reports of that in other places. But, um, so these are uh, things that were said to people in a physics department. So these are specifically in the physics department. And anyone that's from that department or from that institute might recognize that because they were on the walls of that institute. And I took those pictures like from the walls. It's the largest physics institute in Brazil. Not saying which one, just saying <laughs> it's the largest one. Uh, so if I were you, I would change major. Physics is for men. Uh, I will give you an easier exam because you are a woman. Uh, you are as beautiful as you are stupid. You are a woman, you should know how to cook. You are still about to get raped. Do you want black colleagues that know nothing? You need to study more because uh, of where you were born. Did your grandma die? Bring me the death certificate, but you will fail anyway. I'm not going to change my classes to poor students who live in the slums. This is another um, example of the things coming from like the virtual world to the walls. Um, this was a screenshot that I did. So my secret professor asks, uh, if those who stretch their ear also uh, are also willing to stretch, stretch other things. So this is the environment where we are. And I mean, and you know that. that so if you are here in Brazil in a university like that, you're, you most likely know those things happen. Maybe it didn't happen to you, but it's believable because we know those things are sad. However, um, like just a couple of weeks ago, last month, I went to this institution that um, something like that happened. They post things on the walls, the women from the institute, the students, and the professors, they took them from the walls. Um, and they were outraged by, by the things they said or by, the thing, or by being pointed out that they said those things. I, I didn't understand why they were outraged, but they, they removed the, the signs. In your classroom, there are many pretty uh, women, but it's unfortunate one can only look at and not touch them. Feminism is a female genitalia slang. <laughs> Everyone can read in Portuguese. Uh, market. And these are, uh, again, another example of the online to, to the walls. So this is a, from the, this, this university is saying which one it is, but it's this project, uh, Girls in Science from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And, cause it's Federal University and then it's Rio Grande do Sul, right? Part Portuguese, part English. Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul. Um, and these are also, things that were said to students and they were collected. So this group, they collected these messages and they, they formed these pretty posters, but to denounce also the climate there. I thought women would not be able to do this activity like, like you found in Italy, the same, the same, this exact same thing being said. Uh, women only get into college to find a husband. A physics teaching degree is for women uh, who fail in a physics research degree. So if there's anyone here and 
physics education like myself. You know that very well because if you do physics education, then you're seen as a less competent of a person. I need two master's students, an intelligent guy and a pretty girl to carry my books and to serve me coffee. Depending on me, uh, you won't graduate. So that was a threat a student received after she uh, denied going out with a, a professor. You are girls, you are slower, only you didn't understand, so I'm not going to explain to you. Turing is the mother of computer science. So that is uh, also to make, uh, yeah, and the homophobic comment. Okay. Um, find it hard, so go take ballet instead. And doesn't know ballet, obviously, because he thinks ballet is easy. Death to gaze at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So this is uh, another uh, case. So these are students from this Federal Institute here in, in Brazil, and they have been um, trying to report the abuse they suffer. We are um, just earlier talking here, chit-chatting about how hard it is. Okay, there is the climate that's bad, but then it's like, what can we do? And then we can denounce things, we can go to um, ombudsman or ombudsperson, and nothing gets done. Or when there are, there are no sanctions for, for men, for professors who do this kind of thing. Um, here as well, if the student got late, it's because she was in the Senzala. So Senzala is a place where slaves were kept captives, right? And also this morning, we just heard here another example of someone saying, a professor saying something that was uh, not just racist, but um, because for me, that's not just like racist. That's more than racist in a way. I don't know if you understand that. So this is um, someone that was sharing the experience, uh, like an academic experience, like just submitting a, an abstract, something that should be very simple, easy, straightforward. You go to the, I don't know, to the system, whichever it is, and you submit your work. But this person, because it's a, a, this person is a trans person, was having a really hard time just to submit their abstract because this, they, they sent an email to, to the managing people asking, okay, uh, can I submit it with my real name? So name change is something very hard still. And when you, think, when you talk about physics, you say, well, but that doesn't happen in physics. These are like just interactions between people at the university. Um, but when we are doing physics, when you're in the lab, when you are whatever, those things don't have, you know, they, they don't matter. People are not um, concerned about your gender, your sexual orientation, your race, because physics is this free, beautiful, you know, illuminated world. And then, um, I don't know if you heard about this, that happened in, uh, at CERN, because CERN has all these like interested gr interest groups, people that get together and they do meetups and stuff like that. And then someone once thought, oh, I never saw anything about like LGBT people here. So I'm going to try to, to see who are the LGBT people at CERN. And then they posted it on the mural that they were doing this gathering. And then um, there were some of those signs, they were ripped off. Others, they, they were like um, religious sentences that were written there. Uh, others, they were like really offensive messages that people wrote. So that was at CERN. And then APS um, did this report to, to, to check the LGBT climate in physics. So it's already, you know, I guess in the second, their second version of the report. Um, and 
we can see from here, so you see here LGBT men, LGBT women, and gender non-conforming people. Um, and we can, let's just go with this gender non-conforming. If you have uh, problems with the, this terminology, uh, I can understand, but that's how the, this survey was set, so that's the term they used. Um, then what they, they found was that for LGBT women, they felt more uncomfortable than LGBT men, because that's, again, talking about intersectionality. So, oh, being gay or being an LGBT person, it's bad for everyone. No, it's not. It's worse for gender nonconforming people and for LGBT women. So if you are uh, a gay man, you are less likely to feel uncomfortable than if you are a lesbian uh, in the physics department, for example. Um, and then there is this um, quote from a team, uh, from Tim Atherton. He says, uh, for many years I was quietly out. I didn't see the two, being gay and being a physicist, as being related. There is something slightly countercultural about being a physicist. Like many physicists, that aspect of my identity was quite strong. I saw my identity as a gay man as somewhat coincidental. Uh, I've really shifted my view. What motivated me uh, to become an activist uh, was when I was teaching advanced quantum mechanics at Case. At the end of the semester, one of my students emailed me. He said something like, thank you, Professor Atherton, uh, for being an out professor. Uh, you have given me the courage to stop living in silence. My first reaction was, what? I'm out? Uh, <laughs> my, my second reaction was that every student, not just LGBT students, deserve to have empowering experiences from classes. And there are multiple ways we can empower our students. I would say that uh, was a critical event in my life. So, uh, the fact that you can see that you have a professor that's LGBT in physics can help uh, students, and that is the same for uh, like classmates, right? And again, talking about here the intersectionalities of gender and sexuality, we see again that gender nonconforming people, LGBT women and men, they they have different experiences when it comes to harassment in the workplace. Here again. So only 11% of LGBT men, they, LGBT men, mm, no, yeah, well, uh, they, because it's not like L men, right? just the GBT men. Uh, they experience uh, harassment. So it's, and I've heard that, it's like, oh, but the, there is like a gay professor here. People are okay with that. Yeah, being a man, like if you are a white man, gay, uh, that's, I, I'm not saying you're not going to experience harassment. I'm just saying that you're going to experience way less harassment if than if you're a woman. Um, kind of, no. It's actually from all over the world, but most of the respondents were from the US, but it's a, a global survey, yes. And then again here, so trans people. So there's something about observing harassment and experience harassment also. Like you see what happened with other people, but maybe you didn't uh, experience that yourself. So that's the, the difference here. It's my impression that faculty are intolerant and silent bystanders towards LGBTQ students. Upon hearing comments made by faculty, I know there are, that there are negative attitudes and stereotypes toward LGBT people and people of color because we listen to things, right? We all hear. And we see, like, if you go to a department meeting, you, you know. So people here who are faculty, you have been to department meetings, you know how 
people behave, like how people behave, like those men in physics behave. Um, and they say things, and they say it out loud because they feel that's okay, and they feel comfortable saying uh, terrible things. And, uh, and they are going to say things about students as well. So if people, if teachers and faculty, they say things about students, uh, we can imagine how they treat students also differently and how that can uh, remember that um, science identity model. So how those things can um, impact your ability to become a scientist. So when we look at these intersections, right, um, we, we see how our departments, they are very racist, homophobic, sexist, and, and we cannot, and that's why I started saying I cannot just talk about gender uh, isolated, because we cannot shift a, a racialized gender experience to just talk about gender. I cannot talk just about me as a woman. I have to talk about all of me. Um, and well, in the same way, you cannot isolate sexual minorities' experiences. And so I, I just said that earlier, like quickly about scientific identity. So we, when you look at the model, uh, so this perf the performance that it's expected in physics is one that, but that's going to mimic what white, male, middle class, people. And, and then when you look at women, people of color, oh, and heterosexual men, we are all that physics is not, right? Like what physics is, what science is. So we are, we are not that. And when we look at microaggression, so all the sentences, all these looks, all the harassment, all of this make an environment that's really not really nice for us to be at. So it's very, so this kind of event is also very important for us, as people were mentioned in the beginning, for us to see that there are other like ourselves and that we are not like alone and that we can find ways to uh, be together and stronger. And some of the things we can do is, so if you work with physics education research like I do, uh, start to think about race, gender, and sexuality, how those things uh, may play a role in our research, because we usually just forget that. So if you look about uh, research in education and physics education, most of them are made using subjects that are uh, white men. So lots of the majority of the body of the literature that we have that talks about uh, how we learn, uh, how we learn physics and how things are, they, they are using uh, white men's subjects. How that can maybe shift the experience of people who are not white men. Right? So we need to change the research we do as well and to question the research that has been made. Uh, and is anyone familiar with the FCI, the force constant inventory? So, um, but, well, the, the force concept inventory is, is, is this instrument that's widely used in the literature to measure um, like learning. Um, and so it's, like, it's been used for many years and it's very good to say like, oh, this is good. This is a good a way of teaching because then you learn more in the FCI. So it, it's a really, really traditional, like very wide, uh, used tool. And then recently, in the past like uh, two, three years, people have been studying the FCI and revi rev revising it. And they found that there are uh, several questions at the FCI that they are um, gender uh, balanced. So when you look at how men and women, uh, and that only looking in this binary men, women, how they respond to FCI, some questions they benefit men. So how accurate is all, all the things we have been looking at? That's not to dismiss everything we have done, but to analyze in which ways the FCI, uh, some of the questions should be removed, and then we should relook at some studies that we have done. 
um, we have to look, <laughs> nowadays that's harder, that's a harder part to talk, like educational policies, talk about anything that's like, oh, let's talk about education, uh, yeah, policy in Brazil, let's think about government, let's promote scholarships, target to support racial, gender, and sexual minorities. How cool that would be, let's say, to our government to do that. But uh, we need to support, anyway, policies that are targeting, I don't like the word targeting, that are looking um, to protect and promote the rights of underrepresented minorities in science. Because many times we just like, oh, okay, the, this thing is happening, it's, I don't know, at the government level, there's nothing I can do. But we also have to shift our position in terms of influence policy. And remembering that we vote, and not just vote, but then we can have uh, impact by um, contacting um, our Congress people. We, we, we can do that. We don't usually do that in science, and especially women in science. We don't have this articulation of uh, going and looking at how we can do things at the policy level. At least in Brazil, we don't. But that's something else we, we need to start organizing ourselves to do. And in our classes, uh, we should. There are some things that are basic, right? Like being able to to promote name changes more easily, or um, having ne neutral bathrooms in conferences and our buildings. That these these are things that are like basic. I have no problem in going to a restroom. I can just go and. I don't care if it's a male restroom, a women's restroom. I know I can go to any restroom, and I'm not going to be potentially beaten up because of that. So, if, if, you know, this is like basic. Um, and we have to think about that, too. The other thing is, like, you know, we know, like, physicists, we, like, we tend to think that we are funny, and then we tend to say jokes in the classroom. Uh, and that's not funny most of the times, just in general, independently of the joke. But many times those jokes, they are sexist, homophobic, um, elitist. That happens all the time. And when we look at textbooks and educational materials in general, they also bring that. Um, very recently I was in this, um, the History of Science, History of Physics conference, and someone was presenting about um, this Nazi textbooks. Uh, so te physics textbooks from the Nazi period. And it's like, when you look, so the, the exercise, the problems, they are about like dropping a bomb uh, in like to murder Jewish people. And, but the examples are very clear. Because a textbook, even a physics textbook, is going to reflect the culture of the society where we are at. So our textbooks, they reflect the problems we use in class. They reflect also uh, sexism and racism. So we should start to, to look at those things. Because we most of the times, and, and when I say we, it's like myself included, until a few years ago, I didn't think about the textbooks. And like, oh, you know, like one thing is this discussion and the other thing are the problems and you have the problems. But then um, I didn't start looking at it and I was like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's kind of problematic. Let's look at, <laughs> into that. And, and then you start discovering things that you didn't look at before. Even working with gender and working with race and knowing lots of these theories and all, I, I didn't look at the textbook. I didn't realize how many of those problems are problematic. So we need to be aware. And it's, it, it's hard. It's a hard task because we have to be all the time thinking about those things and about all the other things we do. So there are some um, lesson plans that we can um, look at. Da -da -da. Total. There are also like books you can buy. 
you know, that are talking about how to um, <laughs> she wants to take a picture. That are talking about other possible ways to be in the classroom, and then maybe that's not for most of you here um, who are like in academia and not in uh, high school. But we need to change everything, so we need to start looking at like high school level. Uh, undergraduate level everywhere we need to start changing our our science basically um, so finally some organizations there is this national organization of gay and lesbian scientists and technical professionals um, and and it's a very interesting organization and they have a scholarship program this is US, this is US yes but uh, like People from all over, sorry? Yeah, people, most of the people are from the US, but um, we can uh, join. I'm a member of this organization. There is this Prisma uh, that's not really active, but there is, there, they, have a, they have this page. There's the full report uh, for us to look at, and another, You want to take a picture? Another, another ad. So there's going to be the first uh, Brazilian, the first meeting of black Brazilian women in uh, like the sciences. Uh, that's going to be in Salvador, July 27, 28, next year. So go. Uh, and non-black women are going to be allowed to go as well <laughs> against my vote. I said, no, I think it should be only black women, but they were like, no, they can't come. And I said, okay, so they can't come. <laughs> then, then white women can also go, but they, you, you white people can go and attend and participate, but you have like no voice, so there's not going to be any plenary year. And don't, don't talk, you go there to listen. Um, and, and there's going to be also the first meeting of LBT women in STEM, and it's going to be in Salvador as well next year. I don't know when yet, because we just got this uh, funding, uh, which is pretty cool. So it was like just a couple of weeks ago also. Um, but stay tuned to, to know when it's going to be. So, and, and it's very interesting because this money specifically was target, target, the word that I don't like, um, to LB, LB women, so les, lesbian and bisexual women and trans people. So it's specifically for this group, which is, what, which is one thing that's important. It's to have scholarship and programs that are specifically for people, for underrepresented minorities. Um, it's, it's, it's an error when we do things that, okay, it's important to have spaces that are mixed, but it's also important for us to have spaces that are thinking specifically about us, like what's happening here. So there are men, they can be here, yeah, yeah. But there's specifically thought for women, right? Uh, and that's important because there, there are already all the other spaces out there where we are uh, in a minority. So we need these spaces, they are important. And finally, so another thing that I think we can do is, and I was talking earlier in the, and where is she, that I was talking to during the break uh, here. Yeah, we were talking about um, one thing that I've been shifting kind of lately is to uh, discuss and talk more about things we can do like from an individual level because there are lots of things. I, I think it's very important for us to think in uh, policies and all of that. But at the same time, we need to rethink ourselves and think in which ways we uh, participate in these uh, lines of oppressions, in which ways we um, 
uh, have actions that are also oppressive and how we can change. And in which ways the knowledge we build and the science we are doing, they're serving to oppress people as well. So we need to start thinking about, uh, like, as individuals, like, how can we change to, you know, talk about diversity and in general or more inclusive spaces? Because it's, I think it's very easy for us, not very easy, but it's easier to talk about, like, the other and, like, oh, that people do that or that society does that. And, but then we re reproduce lots of things without thinking about it. And I'm not saying it's easy or that I do it. I'm saying that I try, and I think that people should try, because we, we are all um, socialized in this culture. So we are going to obviously reproduce things that are sexist, that are racist, that we, we are going to, because we learn this way. But we need to undo this learning and learn new, new ways of being in the world. So, yeah, so that was this about what I wanted to talk about what I do. So we, we have some time for a few questions, um, but Katemari is staying throughout the uh, activity, so you will have plenty of time yeah. to talk yeah, to I'll her. Yeah, I'll be here until Friday. But... Thank you for your talk. It's uh, not the first time that I see you talking about this stuff, and I always is super, you know, spiteful. Well, I have two questions, but I yes. think that one is more uh, broad, and it's about identity. And I was for ten months uh, abroad, and I saw something that I never saw here in Brazil. The people are using to uh, now in U.S. at least, uh, including in the email or anything that they are like identify themselves, yeah. uh, including how they would like to be colored. For example, For now. she, her, how you would say your identity, and this was super interesting for me because I never thought about it. I mean. Uh, well, but you presented some things about it in the beginning, and I would like to know, to to hear about you. What are you thinking about it? If you think if something like this is actually a strategy, uh, a effective strategy for something like this, you know, I have, um, that is working with us. Um, so it's interesting. It's like it's a, it, it, it's something that is. Uh, well intention, but it's problematic. And one reason that is problematic, so to, to uh, identify like uh, your nouns, like how do you want to be addressed, right? Like uh, he, her. So one of the problems with that, uh, well, many people that do that are cis people to start with. Um, and that is something that can out people that don't want to be outed. Uh, so if you are, because that's something that's happening also like in conference, like, oh, say your name and what are your pronouns, what your pronouns are. Then it's, you're forcing people in a way to out themselves. So that can be problematic. If it's something that people put in their email, like the signature, fine, because like you, you choose to do it, but we have to be careful to not do the opposite and then uh, harm people because that's being starting to be very common at the conference. I go to people, oh, say your name and what your pronouns are, or if you go to uh, conferences, um, at least some of the conferences I go, we have like uh, stickers, pronounced stickers that we put in our, um, this thing. Yeah, the badges. So we put, and it's fine if you want, to, if, if it's not something that you have to do, because some people might not want to say. And some people might be, because there was something that is, so the, the gender expression thing, um, 
it's how people see you because we are we know like what a woman looks like or what a man looks like we have that everyone has that like we socially constructed what images of men and women are uh and so some of these uh, sexual minorities they are what we call invisible minorities because y- you cannot tell right because you can look at me and you can tell i'm a black person right you can I guess uh, say that I'm a woman. That's I can walk out there and people will say I'm a woman, right? You cannot tell by looking at me uh, if I'm straight, if I'm a lesbian, if I'm um, bisexual. You cannot tell that, for example. So that is an invisible minority because you experience that, but people are not seen and. When it comes sometimes with this um, pronouns, then people are, um, let's say, let's say I'm um, a trans person that I'm, I don't know, in the middle of thinking about uh, about all these things, and I'm using an expression that doesn't match with what I am thinking about myself, so. I will have to name it for people in a room. That can be very complicated. So it's like, if, it, if it's not like forced, then it's fine. But still, it's something that, because the, the other thing is like, oh, say if you want it, and then everyone says, and then it, you're like, uh, the only person not saying, it's also something that <laughs> indicating something. Uh, firstly, really thank you and congrats for your talk. It was really nice. And talking about policies, uh, some years ago, I think close to 15 years ago, we had in Brazil uh, a law. It's 10639, the law. It's about uh, including contents. Uh, <laughs> that law, this okay. law here. <laughs> contents of black history and African history in <laughs> all the subjects, in all the levels of, uh, of education. Yes. Okay? Uh, first, what's your opinion about how far we are uh, now to achieve this, the original goal? Because <laughs> we, we know that specifically in STEAM, it's really, really hard to see a really strong discussion about that. And also, um, you, you, you live in the U.S., so the United States had uh, a similar and at the same time a different frame from this, this, this kind of discussion of Brazil, and w- how far we are now um, from a new law, a law which includes a gender, race, and sec- sexuality uh, <laughs> frame and approach discussion. <laughs> uh, it's some kind of a topic <laughs> point of view, but just your opinion. Thank you. A good sense of humor, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> gender, sexual minorities. Now, we are very far from a law like that, I would say. Um, and so this law was uh, 2003, right? Then uh, 2013, there were all these conferences and things about like 10 years from the law. It's like almost nothing had been done. So what happens is usually at schools you have like November 20th, then you have like some celebration, I guess. There, there is something, it's, it's really, really bad still. And it's improving, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, it's like, it's like when you, you look, everyone has already watched Marcia talking about the, like how things are improving not, it's like it's the same thing. So yeah, you see things, but I don't call that improvement. I call that we are still so behind. It's not improvement. Um, we we need to do more. We need to do like aggressively more, and uh, and n- not just that, but the law. I would say uh, because this is like about teaching the history and culture of. Uh, African people and people of African descent, uh, and then the, the the other law, 
that came after that, uh, that changed that, that is the 11, 6, 4, 5, uh, 2008, that uh, includes indigenous um, culture and history and all that. We are so far behind both of them. Um, so I think we need that, but we also need white people to, in a way, stop studying about black people, you know, like, as a subject. So we need to start, to do, because this is about uh, racial relations. So we need to start to look at race, like all, everyone. So being white is a race. People need to start thinking, white people need to think about themselves as having, as being a racialized being. <laughs> like you're a racialized person. So go study some, go study whiteness, go study like the privilege you have, go study other stuff. Don't study black people as like, just an example, if you go to, to the Federal University of Bahia, that city, so Salvador, that city, 80% of people black, this, uh, and you said, oh, that's very hard in STEAM or STEM, and, and you go to the history department, you have one black woman professor. So I think, oh, no, but because but history, you know, it's where you're going to study uh, race things. It's going to be better. It's not. It's really bad. So it's, and, and what is one of the places, the institutions that study blackness or black people the most? It's my institution. And so, so who are studying black people? The white people. So stop studying as, as subjects and go do other stuff and like go rethink. So I think that's also one thing that's needed because when you look then, at lots of things uh, about this law, you're going to see um, white people doing things, which is, of course, it's important. I'm not saying like, okay, white people don't do nothing about race relations and don't do nothing about this law. But it's about um, taking the, the first place. Like if you, if you see funding, then white people are going to get funding to talk about, to produce things about this law, and not black people are going to get funding to produce things about this law, you know? So it became also a market, as everything in our <laughs> science community, it becomes a, a market, like, oh, let me see where I can work. So I think we are very far, very, very far, unfortunately. But we are doing stuff, and there's a lot of stuff to do, so that's another thing. We have still a lot to do. So maybe one last question, and then we go out for lunch. And yeah, because I talked a lot before. Two. OK, two more. <laughs> um, I apologize, because I want to ask in Portuguese so it can be faster. Mm -hmm. um, eu sou da física também, e aí eu fico sempre me perguntando, porque tem um caminho que eu acho que a gente tem que percorrer antes desse, que é que as pessoas entendam que esse tipo de discussão é importante. Porque quando você tenta levantar, eu já tentei fazer isso, estou nesse momento tentando fazer isso, levantar essas demandas específicas né, desses grupos que se atravessam, né, mulheres, negros, é, pessoas da comunidade LGBT+, e por aí vai, a pergunta que vem sempre antes disso é, por exemplo, eu, na física, quando eu pergunto, gente, vamos fazer um levantar quais são as nossas demandas específicas, porque a gente vê isso no nosso dia a dia. Agora, vamos documentar isso para que a gente possa propor, como você disse, ações não só particulares, como políticas de setor, de departamento, de universidade, de, de cidade, de país, e por aí vai. As pessoas falam, ué, mas LGBT na física... Existe isso? É. Aí você fica, oi? Desculpa, não sou entender. Então, é, é, é uma dúvida. É, assim, é, eu sempre me questiono o que está faltando a gente fazer antes, porque a minha dúvida é, eu acho esses eventos que a gente está, que foram construídos, a duras penas, quem, quem faz isso sabe que é muito difícil, mas eu fico me perguntando se a gente não está aqui convertendo convertidos, sabe? E, e como que a gente pode pensar coletivamente de levar essas discussões 
para fora dessa bolha que a gente está, porque essas pessoas já são sensíveis a isso. Uhum. E a gente precisa atingir as pessoas que não são sensíveis a isso, para que elas possam perceber essas demandas específicas que partem do indivíduo e vão para a coletividade. Né? Eu trabalho com saúde pública e eu me vejo várias vezes as pessoas perguntando mas por que tem que ter ambulatório trans? É médico de viado? É o que a gente ouve. Né? Quando, na verdade, você não entende, por exemplo, um homem trans, que isso foi um caso real que aconteceu no Rio de Janeiro, um homem trans que engravidou após um estupro corretivo e coletivo, e ele não pôde ser atendido numa ginecologista porque ele tem lá o sexo designado como homem, porque ele mudou o nome social dele. E isso é muito grave. Só que essas demandas não chegam fora da bolha. Então, não é exatamente uma pergunta que exige uma resposta agora, mas uma provocação para a gente pensar como que a gente faz para atingir, para antes disso, antes dessas políticas, como atingir essas pessoas, né? como falar fora da bolha. Um, recently, I've been sort of adopting a position that is, I don't care about who, I, I, I want to talk to people who are already sort of aligned unless you're paying me. Um, so if you pay for me and it's interesting, like, I don't know, like a place I haven't been yet, I'm going to have time, then I might decide to go. Um, because it's, it's exhausting to talk to people that don't want to, to listen to. So I prefer to talk to people that, okay, it's, you're already engaged in this discussion, so these are the people that I want to talk with. And then we are going to uh, build strategies to public shame others and to go with um, the law and things like that. So people will feel that they are, oh, we need to do something now. Because people who are not willing to talk or who are not uh, interested in this conversation, they just... Um, they drain our energy and then you feel like oh i i i haven't done anything and and you were losing uh your time that could be used to focus on people that are willing to work that are willing to learn you know so that's so that's a very individual response to that so that's how i have been doing i'm not saying that that's how uh you should do i'm just saying that i I don't want to talk to people that. If you don't want to talk that, fine. Unless I'm gaining something from that, like personally, like money, cash, <laughs> travels. Okay. Then I'm not doing it. Bom dia. Acho que ainda é bom dia, né? Eu vou, vou perguntar em por, português e eu vou fazer duas perguntas. Na verdade, tem várias perguntas. Você vai mas... falar comigo agora? Porque eu fiquei sabendo agora. <laughs> So I've just learned that this morning I went to the gym and I, and I said, oh, good morning. I got to the gym. There were two people there. I said, good morning. They were like, oh, good morning. I was like, oh, you're so happy for this time of, you know, in the morning. <laughs> and then now she told me, oh, that was me in the morning and I was happy because I was seeing you. But uh, why you didn't tell me? You were, oh, that's why I was so excited. I was like, Who's like, super excited at like six in the morning in the gym? <laughs> And so, so now, and, and she didn't talk to me at all. Eu fiquei na so just now she <laughs> É, tem várias perguntas, mas enfim, eu vou, vou tentar resumir em duas. A primeira, eu queria saber mais uma questão, tua opinião sobre cota na pós-graduação, cota racial, porque no meu instituto é é uma coisa assim, é você falar. I think, I think the numbers are really low. Like uh, people, like they, they say, I don't know, 20 percent or something like that. I think it should be like at least 50. That's my Mas é muito complicado você falar com as pessoas quando vai falando para a parede. Ah, então, não. eu tenho muitos problemas no instituto por conta disso. E outra questão que é mais é mulheres negras, mas aí vem um, um recorte de classe que, especificamente na gravidez, na adolescência ou na juventude, que independente é, da, da ética, o que é certo, o que é errado, Desculpa a palavra, mas foda-se o que a gente acha que é certo ou errado, está acontecendo. E aí a maioria das meninas que ficam grávidas na adolescência ou juventude são meninas negras. 
e de você ir para a escola pública, ter meninas grávidas e elas olharem assim, ela, nossa, eu queria ir para a universidade, mas não dá agora mais. E você, e eu, uma delas, eu cheguei e disse, não, ó, tipo, tu vai ter que esperar uns dois anos, porque na, univers, na minha universidade tem uma creche que é só de dois a cinco anos. E aí tu espera o teu menino ter dois anos, mas olha que difícil você dizer para uma pessoa, pare o seu sonho, porque você teve um filho e o pai, né? Está fazendo o quê? E por que ela tem que parar? E isso ocorre comumente, com, principalmente com as meninas negras. E aí o que, que a gente pode fazer? Porque eu também fico lutando muito, que as pessoas pensam que, ah, depois de cinco anos, ok, vou deixar minha filha que ela cresce que nem batata lá em casa. Não é bem assim. Depois de cinco anos, ela não sabe cozinhar a própria comida, não sabe atravessar duas pistas para ir para a escola. E eu vou deixar a minha filha onde? E esse é o meu caso, o caso de muitas meninas que eu vejo, que acabam abandonando a universidade ou mesmo nem... Ah, engravidei, já era universidade. E, e aí vem um questionamento que a minha mãe fazia quando eu comecei a estudar um pouco, ler, né, por curiosidade, sobre o feminismo que a minha mãe... Ah, porque tu tá, tá vendo essas coisas de gente rica, de mulher rica, branca? E aí, depois, eu fui... Não, a minha mãe, no ensino fundamental que ela teve, ela não entende dessas coisas, eu vou entender. E eu fui lendo, fui lendo e fiquei, nossa, mas isso é coisa de mulher rica branca. E aí sai um, um, uma reportagem que, ah, mulheres recebem 30% a menos. Aí eu fui olhar 30% que a mulher. menos, mas o homem negro recebe 39% a menos no Brasil. Aí a mulher negra recebe 54,6%. Então, tipo, você colocar numa reportagem, mulheres recebem, que mulheres são essas? E aí eu encontrei essa maravilhosa aqui, que eu quero apresentar outra maravilhosa, né, que também eu vou morrer no dia que eu encontrar, que é a de Jamila Ribeiro, que aí, quando eu vi feminismo negro, eu fiz... Agora sim, eu fiz mãe, existe feminismo para a gente. Você conhece Carla Cotirene? Sim, também. Carla Cotirene é... E aí eu queria. If you don't know Carla Cotidiana, you should be reading her. She's e aí essas faster. duas questões, né? Como a gente falar para as pessoas que é importante, que não, alguns dizem, ah, vai ficar, vai abaixar o nível da pós-graduação tendo cota. Tipo, a pessoa passa por uma seleção. Você não vai entrar lá. Ah, sou negra, deixa eu entrar na pós. Não é assim. E essa questão de da gravidez, Mesmo como a gente fosse. trazer jovens negras trazer ela se a gente não tem esse aporte o que é que a gente pode fazer para ter não 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 and, and uh, seriously I don't know it's hard uh, and that's also part of what we are we are talking earlier that when we are talking about women in science it's like what women what women are we talking about because it looks sometimes that many of the discussions around women in science, they are focused on this very specific women, that it's like we that are here, so they are like middle class women or um, like working class women. And we are a very, very small subgroup of women. We are a ridiculous subsmall group of women. I was talking, uh, to my roommate last night, we were talking about, um, so she said, oh, I'm from Puebla, right? And I'm like, Puebla, that, and then I said, I know this, I know this place, I know this place, there's something about women there. They're like, I know there is something about women. And then, um, then I'm like, no, I know there is something. And then I went and I looked at, oh, it's the city uh, of the disappearing women. And I had read about that before. So uh, there are all these issues, all these things happening with women and the world, and when we talk about women in science, and if we don't um, think like more extensively about who are the women we are trying to talk about, we are going to keep being a small number and to keep just talking among ourselves, but not in that sense, but you know, just for this small group that, oh, look at the problem I have, me, like a tenure professor that, okay, I don't have funding, but yeah, okay, I still have my salary a month, still, I don't know, until well. But it, it's a problem that, uh, it's not like, there are so many other problems that are so much bigger, and then uh, these women that are in high school that are not even going to enter the universities, that, that, that they don't even think about university as a possible place to go. So we are going to still keep being a very small number if we just 
uh, keep trying to reach out to girls in science, but just the middle class girls, just the you know working class that can afford to come to this kind of discussions, or that can go to the outreach events that we go and do in this schools that are centrally located in the cities, because outreach events are rarely like in the outskirts of the cities. So who are we trying to, to get? I, I just also pose problems. I, I don't have like, like, okay, let's fix it. That's the way. I, I don't have that answer, but I think we have to start thinking about expanding like who are the, and like just another thing is like, how are we going to get also um, people to think that this is important if we don't reach out to people, right? Like, yeah, funding get cut, and then, yeah, whatever, they don't do anything important or relevant for us, the, the, the majority of society. I think we, as scientists, we replicate uh, the behavior that mainstream scientists do that is being disconnected with society. So in this sense, I don't think that we women in science are doing a much better job. We are, there, there are initiatives, of course, but uh, at large, we're not being that much better in that sense of connecting with larger society. Okay, so we thank Cathy Marie. I don't thank know you. if there is time. Is, Tiago is not here for the picture. Uh, you said for to take the picture now? But he, Okay, so we will try to take a group picture, but I don't know if the photographer is not here. Okay, good. So everybody down here or sitting? But are we going to sit? I'm sure women can fit anywhere they want. So, <laughs>